Okay. All right. Uh, welcome back, everybody. <laughs> it's the Dharma Doors with MC Owens. You're in the San Francisco Dharma Collective. Yay. Um, I have truly forgot what what part this is. I've, you know, I don't know, but we're going to definitely talk about Bodhisattva Shayamati, Bodhisattva in, Inexhaustible Intellect. Um, and actually what's going to happen tonight is we're going to continue our conversation. I, I definitely want this to be another great night of good conversation, uh, but uh, we're going to continue our conversation about Samadhi. Uh, that's this here, Samadhi, uh, translated as concentration. This is sort of about deep meditation. This is what we've been talking about. Um, in particular, we've reached this point in the sutra, which, you know, this sutra is describing the bodhisattva path. It's describing the 10 stages of bodhisattva progress. It's describing the 10 paramitas, the observations or virtues of a bodhisattva. It has described these 10 visions that a bodhisattva will have right before they abide at each of the stages based on their practice of each of the paramitas. And, and just when you thought it couldn't get any more decimal, just when you thought the Buddha was out of things in tens to talk about, the Buddha introduces, to, introduces us and Bodhisattva Akshayamati to the 10 samadhis of a bodhisattva. And that is what are written here. I have been trying to get to these for a while, um, but we have digressed into a good conversation about what samadhis are in general. And we're gonna keep that conversation going tonight, but hopefully we will start talking about the actual 10 samadhis that a bodhisattva experiences or let me start using my language correctly or at least in, a, in accordance with the text these are samadhis that a bodhisattva attains so these are attainments of a bodhisattva that's going to be interesting to talk about the idea of attaining a samadhi um yeah, and that's what we're going to do. Um, I have no agenda, as usual. I have no notes. I have no, I don't know what's going to happen. Let's find out. <laughs> um, so uh, there's still, I feel like, a lot of remaining ideas from last week where we were just trying to, to get a hold of what a samadhi could be. And I'm going to probably start tonight by complicating this even more. <laughs> with the hope of being able to rain, rain it all back in into a kind of more clarity. So I don't want to obfuscate. I want to clarify tonight. So if at any point I'm not doing that, please stop me. Be like, hey, Mike, roll it back. All right. So, um, so again, we're going to continue talking about samadhi as a general concept. And I think I was going to do this last week. I was even going to do it the week before when we started. So let me do it now. I'm, this is where, what I mean by I'm going to complicate it because there'll be some uh, people in class tonight or in the future who will know exactly what I'm talking about. And they'll be like, oh, good. He's going to talk about that. <laughs> Then there's going to be the other people who have never heard about this. And then they're going to be scratching their heads like, why is he talking about this now? I thought we were talking about Bodhisattva Akshayamati. And so at the risk of opening up, you know, a too complicated of a conversation, I want to address the sort of the larger world of Indian meditation traditions of which Buddhism is one. The idea being, and this is what I definitely said last week and the week before, the Buddha did not invent the idea of a samadhi. The Buddha was not the first person to get into a samadhi. Um, indeed, the Buddha learned techniques for attaining samadhi. And so what we're going to talk about tonight are sort of this larger context of samadhi 
again, what we're searching for, I think in at least this Sunday night class is we're, we're really trying to find a nice Buddhist definition of Samadhi and like, what exactly are they talking about? Or at least what are, what's a general, you know, framework for what they're talking about. And so again, at, at the risk of diverging that conversation, I want to talk about Samadhi in general. So I'm not talking about Buddhism for the next 15, 20 minutes or so. I'm not talking about Buddhism. I'm going to be talking about what would just be called yoga. Uh, in particular, I'm going to be talking about Ashtanga yoga. So if you're familiar with the eight limbs of yoga, the Ashtayanga, the Ashtyanga, the eight limb system, otherwise sometimes called Raja yoga. Um, this is also going to be related to Asamkhya yoga, which is going to be kind of related to Patanjali, who of course is the compiler of the yoga sutras. So if you've heard of all of that, Patanjali, yoga sutras, Ashtanga yoga, Asamkhya yoga, that's what we're going to talk about now for like the next 15 or 20 minutes. And this gets tricky historically because although Patanjali or Pantanjali, however it's actually pronounced, although Patanjali and the Yoga Sutras, and you, you might recognize that word sutra, the Buddha did not invent the word sutra and Buddhists are not the only ones that have sutras. Um, this, this Indian Sanskrit word sutra um, if you didn't know this, it actually means uh, stitched together. It's where we get the English word suture. Like if you have a cut and they sew it up, they suture it, S-U-T-R-E, right? Well, interesting, that word suture in English comes from sutra, from the Sanskrit, which means to stitch together. Easy way to think of a sutra is that if somebody said this and somebody said that or even if somebody told a bunch of different jokes somebody was a good joke teller and you were to gather up all of their jokes and stitch them together into a book you would have a joke sutra a, co a, a collection of jokes in that way so that's all a sutra is actually is a stitching together of sayings of a great master Patanjali is this person who's credited with assembling all of the teachings on yoga and suturing them together into what are called the yoga sutras. And from that text arises a world of meditation in, in India, a world of meditation practice. And in particular, one form of yoga that is very established, very common, very popular in a sense, is what is called in general the Ashtanga yoga system, the eight limbs of yoga. Um, I'm not gonna risk have, uh, there's a very strong risk of this being the whole night's talk. And I don't wanna do it, I don't wanna do it. So I'm not gonna say a bunch of other stuff. I'm gonna reel all of that in. But what I am gonna tell you is, is that the eight limbs are these four preparatory limbs. And these limbs, by the way, they sort of mean aspects of the practice. The, the analogy is that it's a tree and each of these are branches. And so the whole tree of yoga has these eight branches or eight limbs in that way. Four of the limbs are preparatory. They are yamas and niyamas, the sort of do's and don'ts. This has a lot to do with uh, morality, moral purification, but, and I do wanna say a little bit about the idea of morality and moral purification as it pertains to yoga and meditation. But I just want you to know that there's a series of things to do and a series of things not to do. So these are sort of uh, what they call avoidances and observations, yamas and niyamas. Then there is asana, the actual poses that a lot of people associate with yoga, but asanas are just to limber up the body and prepare it for seated meditation. So an asana is the third and the prep another preparatory stage. Then you might do the fourth limb of yoga, pranayama, some breathing exercises to really start 
moving the prana or the chi. It's called pranayama or uh, prana is life force energy, a lot like chi in the Chinese tradition. And so moving the prana, opening up the lungs, doing a kind of uh, breath work, pranayama, is the, is the last of the preparatory stages. And by the way, I'm giving you a very super simplistic reduction of what is a very complex system. But the idea here is, and, and let me address the moral purification and all of that. So some of the observations are about bodily cleanliness and things like that. And then some of the avoidances are avoiding, well, maybe something like say false speech or lying. And of course the Buddhists say no lying. In fact, most people <laughs> are ascribing this this wisdom of avoiding lying, you know? And I know that from a more punitive uh, form of religion in which it's like, thou shalt not lie. Why not? Because I said so. Okay. So there's that sort of system where it's like, why shouldn't I lie? Because God said so. Okay, sorry for asking. There's that. But Buddhism and yoga and what we're talking about tonight, it, one should not lie because I said so. There's actually a very good reason for it. And by the way, this was going to go for any form of morality. If it's like vi about violence, what would be called ahimsa, nonviolence. That's definitely one of the observations is nonviolence, right? And so the idea is, I'm going to go back to lying. I'm not going to lie to you, but we're going to talk about lying. The idea is, is that from a very subtle level, you could call it metaphysical, but I actually don't even really think you need to call it metaphysical. It's practically physical, actually. But from a certain level, the idea is, is that when we commit an act of false speech, and this is knowingly, by the way, if you don't know you're lying, in this instance, it's not lying. It, we don't, it's, we're only talking about when you know it's A, but you're gonna say B. And you know maybe you're saying B because you're trying to save somebody's feelings, but you might have all the reasons in the world to lie. But the idea is, is that when we set up these two realities, the reality that we know to be true and then the reality that we're kind of hoping passes muster, right? The reality that we're hoping to get by on people. When we set up those two realities, we kind of create a little mini psychosis where we're juggling, you know, the, oh, that saying, oh, what a tangled web we weave when we first practice to deceive. It's kind of like that. But it's not about people finding out that you've lied. It's actually about you doing it. And then you're juggling these realities where there's the reality that you know and the reality that you're now propping up. And then the next time you encounter the person, it's like, oh, that's right, I told them this. I can't, I can't mention that. And anytime you get involved in that type of thinking where you're like, oh, I can't, I can't say that because I, I, I lied already. So I got, you're, you're in the, the delusion basically. So the idea is, is that the reason why morality and the yamas, the, these observations in that way, the reason why they're preparatory is because you have to either not do that or you got to kind of flush that out of your system for a while, meaning you have to absorb, observe moral purity in a way, not lie for a while and clear out your system. And the idea is, is then your mind will actually be able to meditate. But if you're running around lying and being violent and doing all this stuff, yeah, you should still meditate and like kind of chill. But the deeper, in particular, what I'm getting at is, is that one cannot reach samadhi. So says the yogis and the gurus and the Buddha. One cannot reach samadhi if one has been out lying all day or being violent all day, or committing malicious speech, or any number of the, those type of things. So you do all this preparatory work, 
and you do asana, body stretching work, and you do pranayama breath work. And then in the next four limbs of yoga, you can kind of actually start doing the meditation. And the four stages of traditional Ashtanga yoga meditation, they are step five, I guess, right? Is pratyahara, the withdrawing of the senses. So this is the idea of bringing your awareness inward. So kind of allowing auditory stimuli, visual stimuli to subside either by closing your eyes, quiet room, whatever it is, but the, this is called pratyahara. We are moving the sense awareness inward, drawing it in. The sixth step would be something called dharana, holding. So this word dharana, the root of it is dar, and I'm gonna come back to this root dar. This is the root of dharma. I wanna, I'm gonna come back to this, but this idea of dar, dharana, holding. So the idea is you withdraw the senses, and then in very, very, very similar, if not exactly like Buddhist mindful meditation, you can think of sati, or smriti in Sanskrit, but sati, mindful awareness, it's just like dharana. It's the holding of the object. The Buddhists do not use the word dharana, but it, 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 it's fine. It's the same idea of holding the object. And then that, the holding, leads to the next two stages, dhyana and samadhi. And if we know about dhyana and samadhi, those are Buddhist terms. But again, the Buddha didn't make these terms up. But those are sort of the next stages of the Ashtanga practice. So you withdraw the senses, dharana, hold the object. <clears throat> dhyana, you start to get into a trance-like state using the holding of the object. And then from that dhyana, that trance-like state, one can move to single pointed awareness. That's one translation of samadhi. Or you could translate samadhi as union, oneness. Um, again, I'm gonna talk a lot of, we're here to talk about samadhi, but that's the idea is that in the Ashtanga yoga system, it's all moving towards samadhi. In, indeed, it is the goal of Ashtanga yoga everything else, even the pratyahara, dharana, and even dhyana are considered preparatory stages for samadhi. In, oh, any questions about that too? Because I realize I did open that kind of can of worms up. So anybody have any questions about that? Kind of the more traditional yoga system um, Michael, quick question. Um, yeah. We talked, I think, last time, if I remember correctly, about different understandings of um, what are interpretations maybe of Samadhi, correct? Was it last week? Yeah. Mm -hmm. In Ashtanga, Samadhi is understood as union, right? Okay, just double check. Okay, right? No? Yeah, I mean, yeah. that would be your standard, yeah, standard. definition of it. One, th I, I suppose, let me say this about that. And, and again, I'm, 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 I'm glossing a very complicated tradition. I'm summarizing it very quickly. There's also an aspect of, uh, I believe it's a yama. It might be a niyama. And by the way, everybody, I might've mixed those up, but just bear with me. One aspect of yoga it's either one of the yamas, yeah, I think it's a yama, an observation, not an avoidance, but there's one of them, which is the idea of Ishvara Pranidhana. Um, and built into yoga is a sort of, and again, I'm, 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 oh, I'm overgeneralizing like a lot. So just be warned. But in general, in yoga, there is a sense of, it's, well, it's a sense of what is called Ishvara. 
Ishvara or Mahishvara, the great Ishvara. Again, this is complicated, but there's a sense of like a higher self, if I could put it that way. I'm, I'm resisting calling this God because I understand what that term might evoke. But the idea of, well, first of all, Ishvara can mean the Lord, like the Lord. So <laughs> calling Ishvara God is not that far off. But the idea though is from a yogic point of view, we are, we have this small sense of self, this small sense of individuality, which would be maybe our ego or even to a certain sense, our Atman or our sense of self or our sense of, of individuality. Part of Samadhi or union. So going to Connie's comment about this idea of union. Well, the union is sometimes described as a union with Ishvara, a union with Mahishvara, with the great Ishvara, the great Lord. But I don't want anybody to, to think that that is God and Samadhi is about a union with God. In the yoga tradition, Ishvara, in particular Mahishvara, who is sometimes Shiva, but it de really depends on your tradition if Mahishvara is Shiva. But this idea is, is that that Ishvara, Mahishvara is your higher self that you are ignorant of in that sense and not identifying with, you're identifying with this physical body that's fated to die and reincarnate, which is why you will reincarnate in that sense. So the moksha or the liberation traditionally is if you can identify with the higher self, like the more cosmic self in that way, then you can kind of through that union experience be liberated of this physical body. And I, I can't say anything more about it. I shouldn't say anything more about it at that point. But in regards to Connie's question about samadhi meaning union, we can start there, which the general sense is, yeah, it's a sense of a union with Ishvara. But then a couple steps to the side or something it's kind of also, again, we're not talking about Buddhism yet. We haven't started the Buddhist portion yet. But in traditional yoga, there's also a sense of union with all things, a sort of union with the totality of all existence. And I would say that the third one to think about, so one is union with Ishvara, the Lord, one is union with the totality of all things. And a third one could be understood as just a union, a sense of oneness with whatever I have chosen as the object of my concentration. So a much more localized oneness not a grand oneness with everything and not a grand oneness with the Lord and God itself, but just this sense of a trance-like state that has been established by focusing on an object, actually blurring where the sense of self and other, the subject-object experience sort of collapses. From everything, from like all of my personal practice, my more scholarly research, everything, the collapsing of the subject-object experience definitely seems to be a part of samadhi. <laughs> and again, that could be on a small scale where one sort of loses sense of self and has a sense of unification or oneness with an object, or sort of where the self dissolves and blurs into a grand totality of all things. Or my sense of self dissolves and I have union with the, the Lord in that sense. All three of those are about the dissolution of a subject-object relationship. 
And I kind of have yet to find anybody talking about samadhi that is not in some way about that. So, Robert, you got some? Is that um, that form of samadhi uh, that you were just describing, is that cessation? No, great question. So let's add another interesting word. So this is going to be a, well, they use it, but the idea of nirodha, <clears throat> cessation, nirvana is sometimes translated as cessation, but nirvana actually isn't the same as nirodha, and nirodha is cessation, and nirodha is the cessation of, well, it depends on the school of thought, but we are mainly talking about the cessation of the three kleshas, the three afflictions of greed, anger, and delusion. When those have been pss, squelched, kind of put out, there is a sense of cessation or nirodha. But let's hold off on nirodha. Let's stay focused on samadhi. Any other questions about samadhi outside of Buddhism? Samadhi in this more yoga system? Yeah, no. Um, the, the yamas and niyamas in particular are very similar to, or their, their, their counterpart in Buddhism is sila, right? Absolutely. And uh, is it, isn't it true also that in Buddhism, you're not, you're not going to get, not going to get any samadhis without some sila. <laughs> like it's, it's kind of that same relationship, right? Absolutely. You know, and this is another, it's another conversation that I, you know, I keep promising that I'll have one day. I don't feel entirely like, in a way qualified to do this, but, you know, I'm not the first person to mention the correlation between Ashtanga yoga. Oh, sorry, Shila is moral discipline, if you didn't know. So yeah, Shila is this idea of, of uh, the do's and don'ts, but it's the word that they use in Buddhism. Um, that, yeah, it's, it's, um, what I was gonna say was, is that I'm not the first person to observe that the eight limbs of yoga are very similar to the eightfold noble path. <laughs> and in fact, if you look at the eightfold noble path, it begins with preparatory type things that are about sort of shila, moral discipline in that way, right action, right speech, and culminates in samadhi. So, it, you don't really have to be a rocket scientist to kind of detect that there's very uh, close similarities. And again, I think that there's, there's probably a very worthwhile, and it might already exist, but a very worthwhile comparison of these systems that really tries to be not sectarian or dogmatic and actually try to pull it back and try to map out what Ashtanga yoga, Buddhism, and a bunch of other traditions, by the way, are all sort of pointing at. So, yeah, so definitely morality, otherwise known as Shila, is you're not going anywhere without that in that way. Okay, so now let's talk Samadhi and Buddhism. Um, I already mentioned it's the eighth step on the Noble Eightfold Path. The step right before that is sati or mindfulness. And that sounds a lot like the dharana that I was telling you about in the Ashtanga system. And so we have a similar process of establishing mindfulness so as to move into a samadhi. Okay, so now we have that piece of the puzzle put together. So we have some mor morality that's going to necessarily be involved. And again, this is from a almost physical or metaphysical position. Um, then there's going to be preparatory meditation, right? Which we're calling either mindfulness in Buddhism or what the Shtangis called uh, dharana, right? The holding of the object. 
The one aspect of Buddhism that's helpful to keep in mind is that in the Buddhist tradition, they talk a lot about, and in fact, it's the way the Eightfold Path is worded. It's not just about speech in Buddhism, it's about right speech. And it's not just about action, it's about right action. And it's not actually just about mindfulness and samadhi, it's about right mindfulness and right samadhi. And you may have heard me say, that implies that there's a wrong samadhi, a wrong mindfulness, a wrong speech. Of course, there's wrong speech. It's something like lying is wrong speech. So right speech is telling the truth. And so what samyak or sama in Pali or samyak, what right means? Like when we say samyak shmurti, right mindfulness, right means correct or proper. And so there's a correct and proper way to do this, according to Buddhism, and there's an incorrect way to do this. And well, the, you know, I could say a lot about this. I, I probably at some point during these talks have mentioned this, but you know, you take something like mindfulness, and the right mindfulness in Buddhism is about the four foundations of mindfulness, that you start with your body, becoming aware of the breath of the body, and then becoming aware of sensations, reactions to sensory stimuli, either negatively, positively, or neutrally. Then the third foundation of mindfulness is meditation on the mind or mind states called citta. And then the fourth step of dhyana of right dhyana or the fourth fourth step of right mindfulness apologies right mindfulness that fourth step is to meditate on dharma or dharmas truths focused and that's all part of right mindfulness i have mentioned that there might be a wrong mindfulness way and an example of which I can think of many actually, but a example of wrong mindfulness might be something like hypnotism. I can, you know, get the watch out and I can be like, you're, you are getting very sleepy, you know? And in a way through something even as, as simple as hypnotism, I could probably even, I'm not even very really trained in it and I could probably do it, but somebody who is trained in it could totally do it, right? and they could bring you to a state of mindfulness. Now, the one of the problems with that is, yeah, that's great if you have your hypnotist on call. So it's like, oh, I wanna get into a nice meditation. Hey, can you do the trick? Can you do the trick over the phone? So the idea is, is that if your mindfulness was dependent upon your hypnotist, or if there was some sort of uh, magical chemical that you could ingest that would bring you to mindfulness, in the Buddhist tradition, they would say, yeah, that's mindfulness, but it's not right mindfulness. And there are many reasons why it's not right, but the main one that I can think of is because it's dependent upon either your magical substance that can get you into a right mindfulness place, or it's dependent upon your hypnotist. In other words, if you wanted to do it and you didn't have your magic chemical or you didn't have your hypnotist, what would you do then? So the right way to establish mindfulness is to deal with that which is always gonna be right there. So the Buddha came up with this really beautiful right technique for mindfulness that's about using the body to move to sensations, to move to the mind state that are being caused by those sensations, to then be able to meditate on dharmas. And so again, the idea is there's a bunch of ways to do this, but this is the Buddhist like surefire way to establish mindfulness. You do that right, you could establish right samadhi. And so again, the idea is, is that there is an idea of wrong samadhi. There's an idea of doing this the wrong way versus doing it the right way. And 
before we talk about the right way and the wrong way, or what might be the wrong way, what might be the right way, let's do a little deeper dive into the way Buddhism uses this term samadhi, like what it kind of means in the Buddhist world. Um, and I guess one thing that I, it kind of goes for everybody, I should have kind of said this at the beginning, the word samadhi, samadhi. So it's one word with two parts. The first part is sama, and the second part is d, but that second part d is actually der or dar, and so it's sama dar, and that root dar means to have or to hold, like dharma. I mentioned dharana in the Ashtanga system, and so the idea of dar holding. And then samadhi, sama means together, sama, to, to bring together is to sam, right? Um, and so samadhi is about bringing together. And I've seen this described a number of different ways. Two that come to mind that I like is first, the, the samadhi, it's about that we begin this meditation with our minds very kind of divided. And as I often mention, this division happens in time in which we have memories of the past, expectations of the future. But then even insofar as we are present, our mind can be aware of, I can be aware of my neighbors, I can be aware of other rooms in the house and noises in the other parts of the house. And so samadhi begins with bringing the attention together, gathering samadhi, holding it as one, bringing it together. And so the idea is you let go of the past for now or forever if you'd like, but forget about the past, Re expectations of the future, let it go. Even awareness of that which is outside your purview, let go until you have gathered your attention entirely right here. So that's the samadhi, but then that can keep going is the idea. And this is where we get into what I mentioned before, the collapsing of the subject-object relationship. So samadhi isn't just about this action, it's going to then be about kind of this action. And I don't mean moving things towards you, but I mean this sort of bringing it even more together. So again, if you're using an object for your meditation, like a candle flame or a colored disc or something, when you start this process, you would be using that object as an anchor for your awareness and your attention and this is what allows you to forget about the past and the future, because I'm just going to focus on this. This is what allows you to forget about what else is going on in your house and your neighborhood. You can just use this. And so dhyana, the first part of this, the trance-like part, it's just about letting go of that which is not currently present here. Bringing it in, bringing it in. But then even when you are very, very present. You are not entertaining notions of the past or the future. You're not entertaining notions about curiosities of what's going on. You're really just present. There's a variety of sensations that can arise from such presence. Those are the various stages of dhyana, various senses of uh, lightness of being or even joy or bliss and these things that arise, but they arise from this extreme presence. But then we keep holding the object until there is this, again, a dissolution of the sense of self and other, and there is just a sense of oneness. That is or could be described as samadhi, that sense of oneness. Again, either just oneness with the object or a grand sense of oneness, a grand, grand sense of totality in that way. But I'm definitely suggesting here tonight 
that that's how to think about samadhi initially. We haven't even gotten to these yet again, but the basic idea on a, on a, um, I guess sort of a conceptual level, because right, unless somebody has totally like samadhied out on me <laughs> right now, we're talking about this. We're not doing it. We're talking about it. So it's a little conceptual at that point, but insofar as we're just talking about the concept of samadhi and talking about the experience of it, the idea is it's a sense of oneness, it would seem. All right, we're getting very close to these, but we still have places to go. Any questions, comments, answers, or ideas? Oh, everybody's curious about where this is going to go. Okay, yeah, yeah. All right. I, I have a quick one. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so where does Samari fit into the, the 10 boomies here? Excellent. So what we are going to talk about, and we are going to talk about this tonight. So what the where these 10 samadhis these each take place when oh well this is this is gets very tricky if i'm going to be true to the text not only are there 10 stages not only are there 10 paramitas there's also it's actually what the numbers on the side correspond to i should probably have written it up there the, the sutra actually begins with what are called the 10 initiations of enlightenment. And it's these 10, um, well, they're called initiations or determinations. And I've spoken about this before, but it actually won't hurt. It will not hurt this Dharma talk at all if I mention it again. <laughs> So we're dealing with this kind of wild Mahayana Buddhistness, yeah, that's about bodhisattvas and the 10 stages and the paramitas and all of this stuff. And it's important to know that all of this is part of the bodhisattva path, which is not the original teaching of the Buddha as practiced by, say, the modern mindfulness uh, tradition, meaning the Theravadan tradition, that early, very early Buddhist tradition, which still survives today in these very rarefied forms, but that early Buddhist tradition, it was a, a, a process uh, for you to be liberated a process for you to escape samsara. It was a process for you to uh, achieve moral purification. In fact, what the early teaching of the Buddha, not by the Buddha, but by others, what the early tradition was called was the Visuddhimagga, the path of purification. That's what the early Buddhist tradition was the Visuddhi Magga, the path of purification. And what they were talking about was the defiled mind, the defiled suffering heart, and this beautiful practice, this beautiful Dharma that is about the purification of the individual. It's awesome. <laughs> we, we should all be striving for purification. However, this Mahayana tradition, which is, you know, basically, arguably, just as old as that other tradition, but this Mahayana tradition that is about the Bodhisattva path, the Bodhisattva is not trying to purify themselves. They have not made a vow to purify themselves or for themselves to reach nirvana. The bodhisattva actually makes this, well, they call it this determination. This is what we call this initiation. There's, there's gonna be 10 of these, but it's this determination to reach what is called anuttara samyak sambodhi, supreme unsurpassable enlightenment. 
This is not the moral purification of a monk or a nun. This is the full enlightenment of a Buddha. And the full enlightenment of a Buddha that a bodhisattva makes the vow to achieve, what is fascinating about that bodhisattva vow, what is fascinating about Anuttara Samyak Sambodhi is that it doesn't happen until all sentient beings are liberated for, from samsara. And at first, that seems like a very tall order <laughs> to liberate all sentient beings and then I can achieve nirvana. But it's not as, it's in some ways a much taller order than even that. But in other ways, it's not as tall an order as it might seem. And by the way, this the only reason I decided to go off on this answer is because this is a great way to talk about samadhi later on. So this bodhisattva vow, and you could call it a form of altruism. In many ways, you could call it the most extreme form of altruism, where it actually is about the bodhisattva putting the enlightenment of all other beings ahead of their own. And so one, it's not as tall in order as it might sound. And two, it's not as self-sacrificing as it might sound. And what I mean by that is, is that the Bodhisattva I don't want to say shouldn't or whatever, but in general, the Bodhisattva does not make this vow from a kind of bleeding heart place of this like, um, yeah, forget about me. This isn't about me. I'm going to save everybody. You know how that sounds, right? That that sounds lame to be like, this isn't about me, this is about me saving everybody. When people hear the Bodhisattva vow, they can sometimes hear it that way. And that's what I mean, that the Bodhisattva does not make this determination or this vow out of extreme bleeding heartness or anything like that. They actually make this vow out of wisdom. And, you know, the, and again, I'm not, I'm only doing this because it's, it's about samadhi, but what we talk a lot about in the Dharma doors, and we've probably talked about it a lot with this sutra, but probably not for a while. One of the ideas that, that we talk a lot about is the difference between a general understanding of an objective reality versus this Buddhist view of kind of an a really wild intersubjectivity where there is no absolute truth, no definitive truth of which there is a God's eye view that can determine who's right and who's wrong. It actually isn't an objective reality. It's actually your subjective experience and my subjective experience. And it's actually wisdom to recognize that they're equally subjective experiences in that way. Like that's part of the wisdom for neither of us to be like, no, I'm right, you're wrong. If we can both recognize that we're having our conditionally produced subjective experiences, that's part of this realization. So in that realm where there's no objective reality, but there's this intersubjectivity, something very interesting occurs to the bodhisattva. And what that occurrences, what that realization is, is that, well, like, for example, many of you, I've never met in, quote, real life. Uh, these are impressions I'm getting through electrons bouncing off the screen in a way. And so there's this way in which, let's just say, um, like, uh, Ramit, we've never met in person, right? We never met, like, at the SFDC, right? So I could say I've met you, but have I? Like, have I really met you? Well, the, the Bodhisattva realization is as well, 
there's this rummet in my mind that is, and right now it looks like it's on the screen, but it's very much impression in my mind, right? And the idea of this, this bodhisattva wisdom, the idea here is, is that I could forget that. I could forget that this is an impression in my mind. And so what would, could happen is that this impression could say something that I don't like. And so I could start getting mad and heaping anger at this impression. And what's interesting about anger that way is it's almost like a, um, what, like a kind of a form of, simp I would call it sympathetic magic, where I think if I get angry enough, it'll hurt you. Like you'll somehow like wither and be like, oh my God, like I shouldn't have said that. And then I could stand victorious and be like, my anger was justified. Sure, yeah, that could happen. But the reality is, is this, uh, here's an impression. Ah, ooh, ooh. And I could just start having this anger fest and the Bodhisattva realizes that they're just talking to a mirror and they're just heaping anger at themselves. And I don't mean that again in the like, you know, hippie, like we are everybody, everybody is everything. It's an actual looking at how anger doesn't translate out to the person you want it to. And so really it just sits there hurting you. My point is when the Bodhisattva realizes that, they go, oh, I should be working on your enlightenment. I should be helping you to get enlightened. I should be heaping compassion out towards all these impressions. Then the Bodhisattva realizes, oh, that's why I'm not getting enlightened until all these people get enlightened. Of course. Does that make sense? I didn't fill in a blank there. I was hoping that you, you would. So, okay. So, by the way, we haven't finished the answer to the question or something about the Samadhi visions. So, the Bodhisattva, in order to do that, in order to achieve Anuttara Samyak Sambodhi, in order to quote, mature all sentient beings, and by the way, that is the word, it's Bodhisattvas do not save sentient beings. Bodhisattvas mature sentient beings. The, the language of save is an unfortunate mistranslation of a word. The word is that bodhisattvas mature all sentient beings towards enlightenment. And that vow, that determination for supreme unsurpassable enlightenment, the determination to mature all sentient beings, well, the idea is, and this is how I understand it, by the way, this is now how I understand this. The Bodhisattva, he, he she kind of makes this determination for enlightenment and the supreme unsurpassable enlightenment. It's like they need to do it 10 times. And the idea is, is that like when you, like tonight, if I was a good bodhisattva, <laughs> I might've convinced you to be kind and compassionate to all sentient beings as a way of being kind and compassionate towards yourself and in that kind of way. So if I did that and you're like, wow, Michael's got a good point about that whole like being compassionate thing. I think I'm going to go for supreme unsurpassable enlightenment. And I'm, I think I'm going to do that like tomorrow or something. I'm going to do it though. So the, but the, the idea is, is that when you heard it the first time and you were like, that's a great idea. That's sort of this initial determination for enlightenment. And the idea is you kind of have to do that 10 times. And by the way, the sutra gives us 10 ways to think about these initiations. 
And the idea is, is that when the bodhisattva makes the initial determination for enlightenment, that initial, initial one, the sutra says that they then, as a consequence, will attain the samadhi of the manifestation of jewels. So, at some point, the question was about these samadhis and their relationship to the stages. And what I was concluding by saying is, is that there are also these 10 initiations and these samadhis correspond to the making of each of the successive 10 initiations, which are about the paramitas, by the way, so the initial determination of enlightenment is about giving. It is about generosity. It is about dana. And so the idea is, is that when the bodhisattva truly makes that initial determination for enlightenment, which is founded on the paramita of generosity, they attain this samadhi of the manifestation of jewels. That corresponds to the first boomy stage of the bodhisattva of, of uh, extreme joy, pramudita, not just mudita, not just the sweet joy of empathic joy, but actually pramudita, like meta mudita, uber mudita is the idea. And just to round this all the way out, when the Bodhisattva makes the initial determination and therefore enters this first stage, right before they enter the first Bhumi stage of Pramudita, the Bodhisattva will have a vision and they will first have a vision of hundreds of thousands of millions of myriads of hidden treasures throughout the world or throughout the universe. That's the vision the Bodhisattva will have. And I think you can kind of see that there's a little correlation between the vision a Bodhisattva has of myriads of infinite jewels everywhere to this initial samadhi of the manifestation of jewels. We are getting dangerously close to like saying something about this sutra. So let's think about all of that a little bit, okay? <laughs> First of all, I, again, I hope I didn't obfuscate. I hope this is clarifying. Yeah, no, you gotta help, let's ha help us out. Well, in the, the order in which these things appear in the sutra, the vision of the jewels comes before the samadhi. But it kind of makes sense that if you entered the samadhi or you attained the samadhi, wouldn't you be seeing the jewels? Like, wouldn't the samadhi come first and then the vision? I don't know, maybe well, it doesn't matter, but it, it's, a little odd to me that they're in that order because i i can more easily imagine having a vision in a samadhi than i can having a vision outside of a samadhi oh okay well now that excellent excellent now we can talk now we can talk so uh, yeah this is perfect because it allows me to sort of try to articulate what i wanted to get across so perfect observation that the the vision happens right before one abides in the stage and then there's this initial determination that brings us samadhi remember you know first of all go if you go back and review i did my best to not define those visions <laughs> meaning i gave you a bunch of different ways to think about what was going on with those but I never wanted to say, and this is what visions mean to a bodhisattva. And if you're not having them, you're a bad bodhisattva. <laughs> it's, you know, I, I have no idea. So similar to this, similar to this, I don't know. But 
just thinking about some of the later visions and thinking about these other samadhis, I think, first of all, it's important to keep in mind that those visions do seem to have been like, um, it's even in the actual grammar and language, they're visions, they're like, you, they're things that you see. And again, maybe you see them in a dream, maybe you see them in a daydream, maybe you see them actually like a hallucination, but they are seen, they are things seen. Whereas a samadhi is always going to be, I mean, this is gonna get really, really tricky real quick here, but we need to keep in mind the first 45 minutes of this talk tonight, which was all about the idea that samadhis are going to be about the uh, collapsing subject object relationship and and unity. One that that vibe. Visions are not unity or oneness. Visions are like, what is that? What the heck? Like it's kind of more very subject object in that way. And there's even the weird visions that were about the bodhisattva seeing their own body but it's still objectified. And I don't mean that in a bad way. I just mean it in the way it's turned into an object of observation. Whereas what I was hoping to do tonight was give you this kind of interesting mind exercise about samadhi, like trying to think of it as unity, but without defining that in any specific way, so that we could then start looking at these, but thinking about them in the sense of unity. And I, I kind of primed us for this a little bit last week when I mentioned that very famous samadhi called the ocean-like samadhi. And this is the samadhi, this is the state of unity, the state of oneness in that sense, that the Buddha was in, traditionally they say, for three weeks, for 21 days after achieving enlightenment. And what we talked about at the end of last class was how that's a description of a samadhi in which the whole universe or what have you, everything in it, every object, everything from the smallest thing to the biggest thing appears as just a wave formation on the surface of a giant ocean. So rather than this being uh, this paper and this paper and this, it's a big sea of oneness. And on the surface, there emerges things that go back into it. And so the oneness or the unity, the samadhi is about seeing this unity, seeing this unity. Uh, experiencing this unity. So again, dissolution of inside, outside, subject, object, because, it, it, oh, I didn't, I didn't mention this. Oh, look, a wave. Oh, look, another wave. <laughs> oh, look, a wave. <laughs> so the, the Buddha or whoever sees even their own being, their own mind state, their own consciousness also as just a wave on the surface. And so it's just one big wave. And that's what I mean about the samadhi. The samadhi is that there's no me anymore. It's just one big sea. And, you know, don't get too carried away with like a sea of energy or whatever. Don't try not to conceive of it in that sense right? It's more of just this feeling in that, in that way. So that's the ocean-like samadhi that the Buddha was in for 21 days. These are 10 samadhis that a bodhisattva experiences after each successive initiation of for enlightenment. This one, jewels manifesting everywhere. Okay, let's talk. <laughs> Um, from the vision, we do have a sense that this is about actually seeing the world full of jewels. When we talked about this vision, not the samadhi, we haven't talked about the samadhi yet, but when we talked about the vision many weeks ago, 
one of the ways that I tried to explain it was, um, and I am, I'm trying trying to explain. I was trying to explain, in particular, the jewel thing, <laughs> the jewel thing. And I probably mentioned during that talk that I get the question a lot as a Buddhist teacher, which is like, you know, aren't all the Buddhists like monks and stuff? And aren't they supposed to like not be into material objects? Then what's with all the jewels? I get that question a lot, right? And it's understandable because it does seem a little contradictory that they are espousing poverty and non-attachment and all of that. And then they're over here talking about jewels all the time, right? So what I tried to mention in that Dharma talk was what are the, Mah and in particular, the Mahayana Buddhists, they love the jewels. What are they talking about? Well, what, and this was just my interpretation, very much, very, very much just my interpretation, just one among many. But my interpretation of that was about the, how to call it, the preferential mind, let's call it, let's start it with that, the preferential mind. The mind that says, ooh, yeah, diamonds, sapphires, rubies. Yeah, those are jewels. They're beautiful. They're rare. They're precious. Those are jewels. All of that stuff over there, you know, all the rest of it, <laughs> not jewels, not jewels. This is beautiful, rare, and precious. That's ugly. There's a ton of it, <laughs> right? And so the idea is, is that in that mode, call it discriminatory, dualistic, or what have you, but that mind is very much in a world of very few jewels that people will fight over, argue over, as the Buddha says, uh, take up stick and sword and defend against each other. And there's one mode, and this would actually kind of be more the early Buddhist, it's kind of very Theravadan in that way. The very early Buddhist mode is to say sapphires and rubies and pearls are like piles of shit. There is, they're just as, they're, ba they're just as suffering as the rest of it. They're just as stinky as the rest of it. They are just as unreal as the rest of it. And so there's this way in which the early Buddhist tradition really likes to level everything, but usually as it pertains to impermanence, suffering, and non-existence ultimately, just the anatman, no, no self in that way. So that early Buddhist tradition is a little like, you know, it is what it is, but there's a way in which it's a little dour in that way. So the Mahayana Buddhists come along and they say, but what if we did it the other way? What about a mind that saw it all as beautiful, rare, and precious? Every single little moat of dust as the most rare, beautiful, precious thing in the universe. What if a bodhisattva had a vision of a world, a universe full of jewels, just teeming with it? In fact, all, that's all it was. That's how I understand all of the jewel stuff in Mahayana. There's much more to it. I could go on and on and on and on and on about that. But that's one way to think about it, I think. Does that kind of make sense? Does it start to vibe as a samadhi? Yeah? Yeah, I would think so, because you're like, everything's like, just like what you said, that's, that sounds to me almost like the bliss of, you know, but that's, that's a Diana, right? But sure. But anyway, but yeah, but, but um, I can imagine like having a union with everything and you're seeing it in that way. 
that yeah yep and what what i'm what i'm hoping you know can happen um is that it's sort of like ocean like samadhi interesting metaphor interesting image interesting um um qualities to work with let's say right like waves like the wave formation and it's like oh i, I mean it's, it makes me want to kind of break dance or something right so ooh, right but that's like the wave samadhi or the ocean like samadhi now it's the jewel samadhi and so my whole goal here tonight and this was definitely going to spill over into another night on samadhi because i do probably now want to talk about the rest of these a little bit more but I want you to kind of think about how this ocean-like samadhi and this jewel-like samadhi, I kind of would like you to think about how they are both saying the same exact thing, like totally kind of saying the same thing, but then they are different, that they're different metaphors. They're different ways of thinking about it and they have their own qualities in that way. And, and I really think it, it's an interesting way to think about all 10 of these, which is, you know, yeah, is how are all these samadhis and, and that there's a way in which, by the way, uh, I didn't, I shouldn't, um, I shouldn't let this go unaddressed. Tanya said something really important, or she alluded to something really important, which was about the equanimity um, in 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 the in the jewel one even the wave one too right because when everything is just a wave it's sort of equalized in that realm right similarly when everything's a jewel it's all equalized in that way and it's kind of like oh wow that's a little dust moat jewel oh wow that's a this jewel like so to jewelify everything is a kind of equanimity move in that way. So I want to kind of, again, I didn't want to let that just um, drift off. That was a great point. And it's something to think about in terms of all of these as well. So ideas of equanimity, as well as ideas of oneness, and then these kind of specific qualities that the, that the metaphor has, right? I have a quick question for yeah. you in regards to talking about waves. Yeah, um, yeah. In the Buddhist understanding, is wave um, meant or understood like symbolically, so to speak, or um, uh, or is it if we go into physics, you know, and I think about electromagnetic waves, I don't know, do you think mm. that has something to do that they actually see the field as literally waves, which the field is? You know, I'm how yeah. okay. <laughs> big stretch, I know. <laughs> no, no. I mean let me okay. Um just thinking about that we say, you know, Buddha was also a scientist or was a scientist, right? So to speak, and whatever science finds out is uh a, like is resonating with Buddhist Dharma. So I'm wondering, you know. Yeah, you know, so let me let me see here. Do, 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 do. Okay, this is this is great. This is great. I'm gonna do it. Um okay, so yeah, I wasn't sure if I was gonna do this, but I will. Uh, I only have 15 minutes, but I think it's enough time. I think this will, it'll be fun. That's for sure. So Connie, your question forces me to talk about something that I was debating about whether I would address. So um, last time, last week, I mentioned uh, Edward Konza's book on meditation, just called Buddhist Meditation. That it's kind of like from the late sixties, but it's still pretty good, but it's very scholarly. I mentioned, the Sarbacker book just called Samadhi, uh, the numinous and sensitive in the, you know, I mentioned this book, good academic book last time. 
Um, I mentioned Kumara Jiva has a book on the sutra. This is a commentary, but it's a on the samadhi of sit sitting meditation. I mentioned this last time. So there's a lot of, and, and all of those sources are interesting to, to go between, to find commonalities, but to find differences. There's one more book that I was, mm, I wasn't sure if I was gonna mention it, but you forced my hand, Connie. So this book is actually called uh, 25 Doors to Meditation, a handbook for entering Samadhi. So, and it's by uh, Baudry and Shumei, B-O-D-R-I is one of the author's last names. And the other last name of the author is Shumei, S-H-U hyphen M-E-I. This is a very interesting book. If you decide to dive into this book, you, have, you are being warned. This is one of those wild, um, I, I would call it syncretic, um, syncretic, it's a, it's a, mm, it's a Chinese, well, what I mean by syncretic is it's like kind of Buddhist, kind of Taoist and kind of Hindu and a little bit of everything in between. So you are warned, this is not exclusively a Buddhist handbook for Samadhi, but having read through it, it's very, very Buddhist, but it's just its own, you're not gonna find, this is its own universe here, in other words, but I approve of what's in here, as long as you know what's in here. Um, a lot of this book actually comes from a Buddhist sutra called the Shuram Gama Samadhi Sutra. So there you have it, the Samadhi Sutra. And in fact, the 10th Samadhi that we will talk about at some point is called the Shuram Gama Samadhi. Shuram Gama means durable or in, in unbreakable actually. So the highest samadhi of a bodhisattva, the Shurangama Samadhi, has its own sutra. It's called the Shurangama Samadhi Sutra. And in that sutra, it has a lot of wild meditations, like a lot of wild visualization suggestions. A lot of the techniques in this book come from that, if that makes sense, if I didn't confuse you. But it also sprinkles in a bunch of Zen stuff, some Taoist stuff, even just some Hindu, like uh, I guess more of the yoga stuff I was speaking about. So I share this with you because it's a very interesting book. And if you can find it, I think you will actually enjoy some of the meditations. They are all very, well, they're all focused on attaining Samadhi. And there's actually 25 different ways to do it. The first method and this is where I was like, gonna do this, but then I wasn't, but it's Mother's Day. It's Mother's Day. So the first samadhi in this book is called Union Samadhi with Child Light to Realize Mother Light. And Connie, I, I'm doing this to answer your question. <laughs> and your question, by the way, was about waves. And are they talking literally about waves or figuratively about waves? Are they talking about energy formations and that kind of waves? Like, what are they talking about? Well, in just the first chapter, it says there are two types of light in the universe, one called mother light and the other called child light. Mother light is the invisible, formless basis of light that can give rise to physical light. And physical light is the light that we see and can measure because it has form and it has appearance. The images of the physical world that we see with our eyes, including brightness, darkness, shade, and color, are the light with form that cultivation schools term child light. While child light is visible, the true mother light is not something we can see with our eyes because it is fundamentally formless. 
cultivation science says that our true self nature is akin to this mother light, but its formless radiance is something that we realize with the mind rather than something that we perceive through the senses. It goes on to the meditation on mother light and child light. And it is basically a meditation on a light source like a candle flame. And it describes essentially persevering through the staring at that candlelight. I'm not gonna go through it. If it's something that appeals to you, you should, you should get the book. Again, it's interesting techniques for establishing samadhi, different types of samadhi, but they kept using that term cultivation science. Yeah, this is a cultivation science book. And that's what I mean by it's like, it's its own thing. It's its own thing, but from somebody who knows the Shurangama Samadhi Sutra, I can tell you that it comes, you know, it's, it's legit in, in other words. So the reason why I shared that with everybody is that distinction between mother light and child light. In other words, anything physical, even if it's as something as amorphous as light, if it's in that realm, it's, it's lower registered realm of form, not real, totally imaginary, totally made up in that way. And so my answer to Connie's question is, is that I think any use of the word wave as an analogy is going to be a just that an analogy and it may have to do with well kind of like oh uh, oh can i make up an idea of like well no i don't want to do that to you i'm not gonna make any more ideas but it there's a way in which you could think of the the wave as an archetypal type of formation and what I mean by that, it's, it's a way that um, all of us humans in that sense experience uh, phenomena is, it, is in a wavy way. But th that, wouldn't, that should not be construed as the real way. It should be construed as a commonality. And so when we start to have experiences and this you know people find this in hallucinatory experiences all the time where you know your conditioning determines a lot of how it plays out in that way right so it might get freaky but when you look at it you're like but i know why it got freaky like that <laughs> right it, it's like okay so similarly once we get in these deep samadhis if things start to undulate let's say like waves it may not be that everything is energetic waves. It may be that that's what st it starts to look like when things start to break down in that way. I don't know. That's just uh, an idea about that. Any <laughs> other questions, comments, or ideas? Can I add something? Yeah, please. Yeah, I've, I just thought of like, you know, uh, um, mother light and child light was basically just form and emptiness, right? That was the... It was the whole hard to train, just the instruction yeah. of. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and actually, yeah, I won't, I won't dive any more into that, but excellent. Yeah. It's so tempting. It's so tempting <laughs> to dive deeper into that, but I won't. <laughs> any other questions, comments, answers, ideas? All right. Um, well, Let's see. Yeah, Can't that's wait till next week. You know what I'm saying? Um, next week, just to give you, I, I will probably really try to move through all 10 of these, but I would like to give them each their due time, not a whole night on each one in that way, but some of them are interesting. Um, oh, by the way, no, no, it's too late. It's too late. It's too late. It's too late. Sorry. So, but anyways, yeah. Oh, don't, don't tease us like that. <laughs> oh, I can't, I can't though. I can't. It just wouldn't even. It wouldn't even be worth it. It, re it really, really is like. So. All right. 
Cool. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm not going to risk opening up a new samadhi because all of that, but awesome. Then that's it. Um, oh, by the way, because this is, we have just a few more minutes and I want to share one other book. So if, if any of these books I've recommended are appealing and you like the slightly more scholarly stuff that does more like uh, across the board, if on the meditation tip, you like reading the more scholarly stuff about it, this is probably my favorite book. So it's called On Being Mindless, uh, Buddhist Meditation and the Mind-Body Problem. This is a great book. I really like this book. It deals primarily with that really, really elusive samadhi, actually, that really elusive meditative state where there is nothingness, where there is absolutely no uh, mental activity. They say you don't even breathe. You're not talking. It's total absolute stillness. This is a very, very established part of the Buddhist tradition, arriving at this uh, ayatana of nothingness. And what's really interesting, and this is why you, will, you won't find this anywhere else in a way. What, what this book is about is, well, like many great uh, pieces of scholarship, it covers the whole, all the dhyanas, all the samadhis. It talks about different traditions and how they deal with the different dhyanas and different samadhis. So it's a great overview of all of that. But what his thesis is and what he's interested in, why he calls it the, the, about the mind-body problem, it's all about if one gets into that state where there is no mental activity, no physical activity, nothing, and it's totally still, what produces the thing that would cause the person to come out of that state? they would need to like have a thought. But if all thinking has ceased, what propels the meditator to come back from the state of nothingness? It is a, it is a awesome study of that very interesting idea that actually has a lot to do with sleep and why we even wake up when it's time to wake up. The, the, just so the, the short answer is, is that because as the meditator, you know it's time to get up. <laughs> but it's way more complicated than that. So anyways, that's all my books. That's all my recs. That's it for Samadhi part three. <laughs> part four will we'll be here next week. So, all right. Oh, thank you all so much. Love seeing you all. <laughs>